Welcome to the Grace and Truth Program, a ministry of Word of God Christian Church, Beaumont, Texas. Romans chapter 15, verses 1 through 6. This is the Word of God. Romans 15, 1. We then that are strong are to hear the infirmity, or bear the infirmity of the weak, and not to please ourselves. Let every one of us please his neighbor for his good to edification. For even Christ pleased not himself, but as it is written, the reproaches of them that reproach thee fell on me. For whatsoever things were written aforetime were written for our learning, that we, through patience and comfort of the scriptures, might have hope. Now the God of patience and consolation grant you to be like-minded one another according to Christ Jesus, that ye may with one mind and one mouth glorify God, even the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Our Father, again we ask you to bless the word to our hearts. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 You may take your seats. Thank you. So we've been talking for the past two weeks about the importance of unity in the body of Christ. Unity, that virtue of oneness, of being on one accord, of being of the same mind. That's critical to the body of Christ. And so Wednesday night we talked about some of the attributes of unity and oneness. We talked about it being, the, being symbolic of wholeness, oneness, unity being symbolic of wholeness and completeness. It's complete when you're one. Oneness is completeness. We said that oneness is the number of creation because when you go from zero, from nothing to something, you come up to the first numbers one. One is the number of creation. It's the next step from nothing, from zero. We talked about how oneness is naturally an attribute of God. It's an attribute of the true and living God and therefore a quality to be found in his people. If God is one, then his people ought to be one. His people will be one. In John chapter 17, we saw that Jesus prays, as Paul does here in verses 5 and 6. Paul prays the same prayer. He's praying for unity of the, of the body of Christ. Jesus prayed, and Paul is praying, that God's people may be one. And in Jesus' case, in John chapter, chapter 17, he gave two reasons why our unity is critical. Number one, remember these from Wednesday night. Number one, we should be one because Jesus and the Father are one. There are three persons in the Godhead, but there's one being. There's one purpose. There's one mind in the Godhead. The second reason is because our unity testifies to the world that Jesus is the Savior sent from God. Our unity, our oneness, the, the oneness of the body of Christ testifies to the world that Jesus is the Savior sent from God. That's what Jesus said. He says our unity testifies to the world that he is the Savior. And so the word exhorts us as people of God to endeavor. I mean, we ought to make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit. Make it our business. Go out of our way. Take the hit to keep the unity. Do everything we can to maintain the unity of the Spirit. That's from Ephesians chapter 4. God is one and so his people ought to be one. So today we're focusing on how that oneness and how that unity looks in practical everyday life. Specifically in terms of pleasing and edifying our neighbor. In everyday practical life, how does unity look? We're going to look at it as it applies to pleasing and edifying your neighbor. As it applies to coming alongside and bearing one another's burden. Getting under the load with your brother or sister. Sharing in their burden and their joys as well. I'm going to talk about how that really looks in real life, in real time. And so I'm hoping and praying that the message today will inspire us to be more active in maintaining the unity of the church and maintaining the wholeness of this body, which means we have to take a hit, take the short end of the stick, be offended even, amen, in order to maintain the unity of the body. It is that critical and you are that less important than the unity of the church. When you compare the two, you are not that important as the unity of the whole body. 
So I hope after we go do what we're going to do today that you'll be inspired to, to maintain, to do things that will maintain the unity of the body. To begin with, the exhortation here in verses 1 and 2 says to us, it says the strong ought to be willing to put up with the bad behavior and the poor choices maybe of the weak and the unlearned. The strong ought to bear the infirmities of the weak. That means you ought to be able to put up with their bad behavior, their bad choices, their poor choices, their unlearned decisions. We ought to be, if we're strong, we ought to be able to put up with that if you're the stronger one. Amen? He says and we ought to accept at the same time that our tolerance is going to cost us. To tolerate the weaker brother, the unlearned, bad choices, that's going to cost you in the denial of yourself. Denial of your comfort and your convenience for the edification of the weaker to keep the unity of the body. Tolerance, putting up with the weaker, will cost you. And you have to be willing to take it. You have to accept that. That's what this exhortation is saying to us here in verses 1 and 2. To do that, to be that tolerant, is not something uh, for the natural man. It's out of the question for the natural man. He's not going to deny himself. He's not going to put himself second. But not us. We will do that. We who are born of God, we are called to do that. It's of our nature to do that, to put ourselves second. We are born of God. And then he gives us a couple of examples of why we ought to do it. In verses 3 and 4, 15, 3 and 4, he says, For even Christ pleased not himself, but as it is written, the reproaches of them that reproach thee fell on me. And then for whatsoever things written aforetime were written for our learning, that we through patience and comfort of the scriptures might have hope. Our two examples is the first one is Christ. While we ought to put up one another, even Christ, our Redeemer, pleased not himself. But he endured the cross and despised the shame that he might bring us to God. So why should I put up with the weak ones? Why should I worry about pleasing you? Because even Christ... Please not himself, your savior. He pleased not himself, even the son of God. He faced the cross, he took it upon himself that he might bring us to God. That was for our good. And so who are we to say, what do you mean pastor, please someone else? Well, I, I'm, I'm not like, that's not me. Well, are you born again? That is you. Christ is your savior and even he pleased others. He pleased you, he pleased God. Not my will, thy will be done, he says. And he died that he might bring you and I to God. And the second reason, he says, there are many other witnesses from the past. He says, but things written before time, they were written for our learning. So he brings past. He says, their experiences were written in the scriptures for our learning. Men from the past did the same thing. They pleased others. They are our example. Two examples, Christ and the witnesses from the scripture. So holding these things to be true, that the scriptures are written for our learning, I want to take you back to an incident in the life of Abraham, the father of faith, to an incident in his life that will show us what it looks like in real time to actually bear the infirmities of the weak and to look out for your brother. Turn, if you will, to Genesis chapter 12. We're doing what it says in Romans 15:4. What things are written before time were written for our learning that we through the scriptures might find comfort and hope. So we're going back this morning to examine an incident from the life of Abraham. We're going to start in Genesis chapter 12. Now we've come to this portion of scripture to look at one incident from the life of Abraham. So we'll be skimming through the narrative of his life. We're going to skip over some passages that would normally take us months on end. You know how we do it, right? Verse by verse. I'm not going to do that today. I'm going to have to skip through this narrative because I want to get to this incident in his life and I want to stay on point. So keep that in mind. We're going to be skipping through and skimming through uh, the word this morning that we might follow up with this incident in his life. So notice Genesis chapter 12, verse 1, and then we're going to read right after that verse 5, okay? So Genesis chapter 1. Now the Lord had said unto Abram, Get thee out of thy country, and from thy kindred, and from thy father's house, unto a land that I will show thee. And then down to verse 5. And Abraham took Sarah his wife, and Lot his brother's son, and all their substance that they had gathered, and the souls that they had gotten in Haran, and they went forth 
into the land to go to the land of Canaan, and into the land of Canaan they came. And so we're, we're in the Abrahamic covenant here in Genesis chapter 12, but we're not going to go into that by, in detail today. Only to say that when Abraham left the land of his birth to follow God by faith, he took his nephew Lot with him. He took Lot with him when he left his father's house as God had ordered him. Okay? Now look at verses 6 and 7. So they get to the land of Canaan. And Abram passed through the land into the place of Shechem and to the plain of Moray. And the Canaanite was in the land. And the Lord appeared unto Abram and said unto and said, Unto thy seed will I give this land. And there built he an altar unto the Lord, who appeared unto him. And so notice, the Canaanites were in the land at that time. But God promises this land to Abraham and his seed. God, people are already here. God says, no, this is going to be your land. Somebody says, that's not fair. Well, the earth is the Lord's. Psalm 24. The earth is is the Lord, right? And he gives it to whomsoever he pleases, full stop. You got a problem with that? Talk to God. Amen. It's his land. The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof, Psalm 24, 1, because he has founded it upon the seas. God made the land. The Canaanites would now, if you read history, you'll see that God came to them and offered them salvation, but they refused. The Bible says Israel was in Egypt 430 years before they came back to this land because God was giving the Canaanites a time to repent. The Bible says you'll go back when their iniquity is full, when I can't take it no longer. Then you'll go back. Because he didn't give it to them right here. He gave it to them 430 years after this. I'm not trying to justify God, but I want you to know that your God is a good God. And all that he does is good and righteous. If he gave them the land, it's their land. Amen. God owns the land. I just want to I couldn't pass that up. Amen. And so they're in the land, and there came a famine upon the land, and Abram had to go down to Egypt in order to survive to escape the famine. And being worried that Pharaoh in Egypt would steal his wife and take his life, Abram hatched the plan to save his own neck by saying that Sarah was his sister. And so Pharaoh did take his wife. He took Sarah into his own home. And he prospered Abraham abundantly. He said, Abraham, you're a good man. Take these sheep and these goats and some of this gold and silver. He prospered Abraham abundantly. But God plagued a Pharaoh's house. God would not allow him to violate Sarah, Abraham's wife. He plagued his whole household and, and Pharaoh realized something is wrong. It must be this woman. Amen. And so Abraham and his entourage and all his possessions that Pharaoh had given him, they were all cast out of Egypt for fear of the Lord. They get back to the land of Canaan. And so Abraham and Lot both left Egypt with great possessions, much cattle and silver and gold. We're down to chapter 13, verses 1 and 2. Are you keeping up with me? All right. Chapter 13, verse 1 and 2. And Abraham went up out of Egypt, he and his wife, and all that he had, and lot with him into the south. And Abram was very rich in cattle, and silver, and in gold. Now go down to verses 5 through 7. And Lot also, which went with Abram, had flocks, herds, and tents, and the land was not able to bear them, that they might dwell together. For their substance was great, so that they could not dwell together. And there was, a little, there was a strife between the herdsmen of Abram's cattle and the herdsmen of Lot's cattle. And the Canaanite and the Parasites dwelled in the land. Now, as always, with great possessions come great responsibility. And sometimes great strife. Think about that. Riches take responsibility. They take thought and sometimes they separate families. Sometimes they separate husband and wives. Amen. Sometimes riches can bring strife even among brothers and sisters in Christ. These men were enriched going to Egypt. They both had all kinds of silver, gold, land, and money. But all of a sudden now they can't live in the same land because they got too many cattle. You like that big house? It's more work. You like that real big house? It takes more money to cool it. 
more money to heat it, more paint to paint it. It's a lot of worry, lots of concern. It's good, you, I, amen, I like it too. But just understand, with great riches and great possessions comes great responsibility. And sometimes great strife, even among brothers and sisters in Christ, amen. But if there is one who's wise enough and strong enough to value the godly virtues of unity and peace over material things, if there's one who's strong enough to put up with the self-seeking and self-serving behavior of the weaker brother, then strife can be avoided with the riches. Then strife can be avoided. Notice what happened here with Abraham, uh, how Abraham dealt with this. So they can't dwell together. But look, Abraham said, we're going to look at verses 8 through 9. And Abraham said to Lot, uh, let there be no strife. Let's not fight about this. There'll be no strife. I pray thee between me and thee. Because in verse 7, you know, you got the Canaanites and the Perizzites are watching them, right? You see that? They're in the land. They're watching this. These are supposed to be these people of God. God called this man over here. He's supposed to be all this. And look, they're fighting. So Abraham notices that. He says, come on, let there be no strife between you and I. I pray thee between me and you and between my herdsmen and thy herdsmen. For we, what? We are brothers. We are brothers. This stuff should not separate us. Here's the wise one among them. And so it is it's not the whole land before thee. So separate thyself, I pray thee, from me. If thou wilt take the left hand, then I'll go to the right. If you depart to the right, then I'll go to the left. Look at Abraham, wise man. Abraham says, I know how to handle this. Now remember, the call of God was to Abraham, not Lot. But Abraham brought Lot with him. God called Abraham. He didn't call Lot. Lot is a secondary character here. God called Abram. He's the one that gave, God gave the covenant to, not Lot. And also the promise of the land was given to Abraham, not to Lot. But here Abraham is big enough to say, you choose the land that you want. You pick. Whatever way you pick, I'll take the other side. The whole land is before us. They got desert, they got ocean, they got water places. You take the one you want. I mean, a wise man, I know what I'm going to take. Oh, Lot figured out, you let me go first. I know what I'm going to do, right? Now also, Lot's the younger one. Why is he choosing first? Because of the graciousness of Abraham. He should choose first. Maybe Lot should have suggested that, but he didn't. He chose first. Abraham let him chose first, choose first, and he did. He says, you take your choice of man. Obviously, Abraham, Abram had great affection for his nephew Lot. He loved him. He cared about him. He sought his good and his edification because he is his brother. That's what the word tells us to do. The word calls us to do the same thing. As believers and members of the one body, we ought to be concerned about our brother. We ought to be gracious enough to love our brother. Amen. The word calls us to do exactly what Abram done here. Amen. As believers and members one of another, we are brothers. We share in the fellowship of Jesus Christ. How can you love God and not love your brother, John asked. If you're a part of him, how can you not love me, who also am a part of him? If you are a part of him, how can you run me down? I'm a part of him too. How can you not forgive me? How can you not overlook my, my mistakes, my weakness, my ignorance? I make bad choices because sometimes I don't know. And that's not an excuse. You ought to know, weaker brother. You ought to get stronger. We don't have time to carry you. We're in a battle. You need to pick it up. But meanwhile, we'll, we'll put our arms around you, but you need to pick it up, weak brother. You do. We're not here to babysit. Amen. We have to fight. Amen. You know about the baby buggy, right? We'll push it. That baby got a beard. I'm not pushing that buggy no more. Get up, baby. You got to walk. You grown now. But we ought to bear the infirmities of the weak while they grow. Now, you need to grow. Your, your responsibility for you is to grow. And so Abraham had great affection for his brother and he sought his good and his edification, which is what we should do for our brother. We should seek each other's good, each other's edification, amen, rather than run each other down, amen. And so, put in verses 10 through 13. Here is what Lot chose. And Lot lifted up his eyes and beheld all the plain of Jordan, that it was what? Well watered everywhere. Before the Lord destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah, even as the garden of the, it's like Eden. 
You let me choose first? Oh boy, I know what I'm choosing. It was like uh, the garden of the Lord, like the land of Egypt as thou comest unto Zoar. Look at Lot. Look at Lot. Without hesitation, without even considering his elder, he chose the best part. He chose according to what he saw, the lust of the eyes, right? The pride of life. But you see, God was with Abraham. God was with Abram. You know, Scripture calls Abram the father of faith because he believed God. And here's an example. Abraham could be gracious in dealing with Lot because he believed what God said to him. He believed God said, all this land is going to be yours and your seeds. He could be gracious. He could take the short end because I know what God said. God is my portion. You can take the best part because God has got me. Now you can do that. If you know who you are in Christ, you can forgive your brother. Amen. You can take the short end. You know that there is reserve for you an inheritance in heaven that nobody can take. It belongs to you. Eyes haven't seen it. Come on. Why are you upset? Why are you mad about a few dollars and a place in line and a chicken plate you didn't get? My God, what is, what, what is with us? We cannot afford to do that, Christian. Amen. We're bigger than that. We're better than that. Amen. Abraham could be gracious with Lot. Dealing with Lot because of what God had promised him. And Abraham believed it. That's why he's called the father of faith. He believed God. He was confident in God's word. And so he said to Lot, you take the upper hand. I'll take what's left. I'll be all right because God is my portion. You go first. God's got me. I, I, I'm not worried about me. You take the first hand. Because that'll just resolve the whole thing. We're not going to fight. I know you'll probably take the best part. But I'm, I'm, I'm okay. Because God is my portion. And then God affirmed his word to Abraham. Look at verses 14 to 18. Abraham did what was right. And then God confirmed his word to Abraham. He says in verse 14. And the Lord said unto Abraham after Lot was separated from him. Lift up now your eyes. And look from the place where thou art northward, and southward, and eastward, and westward. Now Lot went to the east, but God said, look east, that's yours too. What he think he took, that's yours too. <laughs> look east and look west. For all the land which you see, to thee will I give it. And to thy seed, how long? And I will make thy seed as the dust of the earth, so that if a man can number the dust of the earth, then shall thy seed also be numbered. Arise and walk through the land in the length of it and in the breadth of it, for I will give it unto thee. Then Abram removed his tent and came and dwelt in the plain of Mamre, which is in Hebron, and built there an altar unto the Lord. So God restates his covenant with Abram, including the promise of the land. And then Abram moved on to Hebron and built an altar and he worshiped God. He was satisfied, didn't complain. And, oh man, I shouldn't have did that. Oh, he didn't complain, he worshiped God. He was content with what Lot had left for him. And Lot, he headed east to the cities of the plains, Sodom and Gomorrah, cities of the plains. But that's not the end of the story. Chapter 14 continues with the coming of war in the land that Lot chose. There was war in that land. It begins in chapter 14, and we're going to look at verses 8 through 12. And there went out the king of Sodom, and the king of Gomorrah, and the king of Adma, and the king of Zebulun, and the king of Bela, the same as Zoar, and they joined battle with them in the valley of Siddim. With, here's who they fought. With Chedorlaomer, the king of Elam, and with Tidal, the king Tidal, the king of nations, and Amraphel, king of Shinar, and Arioch, king of Elisar, four kings against five. Amen. And so, and the valley of Siddim was full of slime pits, and the kings of Sodom and Gomorrah fled, and they fell there, and there, and they that remained fled to the mountains. And they took all the goods, Sodom and Gomorrah, and all their victuals, and went their way. Amen. Four kings came against the, the kings of the cities of the plains, which includes Sodom and Gomorrah. They came against them. This is where Lot chose to live. And they defeated the kings of Lot's area and chased them to the hills. They beat them down and took their stuff, chased them, put them to flight. Now, 
these four kings would have done well enough to fight against the cities of the plains and take their land and all their possessions. But the mistake they made that led to their destruction was in verse 12. They took one thing too many. They took a lot. They took one thing too many. Take the land. Take all that stuff you want to. Beat them up. It's okay. One thing you did wrong. You took a lot. You took a lot. Abraham's brother's son. Maybe they didn't know. Maybe that somebody should have told them that Lot is a kinsman of Abraham. The man that God covenanted with to make of him a great nation. The man that God said, I'm going to bless them that bless you. And they didn't know this. I'm going to bless them that bless you. And I'm going to curse them that curse you. You, you. you shouldn't do harm to a man that God says he's going to curse them that hurt, curse you. Maybe they didn't know that. Maybe they didn't know that through Abraham, God was going to bless every nation of the earth. That's in the Abrahamic covenant. God said, I'm going to bless all the families of the earth through your seed. Maybe they just didn't know that. So they took Lot. They took Lot, Abraham's brother's son. Now looking at it from an entirely human perspective, we might think, well, good for Lot. He took the best part. Good for him. Let him lay in the bed that he picked. If you wanted that nice land, so what? Lay in your own bed that you made. But Abram is not like that. Abram is a man who believed God. And because he believed God, the Bible said his faith was counted unto him for righteousness. And that righteousness brought Abraham into a relationship with God in which he was big enough not to be petty and vengeful. His faith was counted for righteousness. That righteousness made Abraham a friend of God. It put him in good standing with God. It did something to his inside. It made him a different person. It made him big enough and strong enough not to be petty and vengeful. Amen. Look at verses 13 and 14. Verse 13. And there came over, there came one. Well, in fact, let's begin at 12. And they took Lot, Abram's brother's son, who dwelt in Sodom and his goods, and they departed, those kings. And there came one that escaped and told Abram the Hebrew, for he dwelt in the plain of Mamre, uh, the Amorite, brother of Eskol, the brother of Ab Aner, and these were confederate with Abram. And when Abram heard that his brother was taken captive, he armed his trained servants, born in his own house, 318, and he pursued them unto Dan. He went after them. Amen? Now, we don't know of Abraham being a man of war. We don't read that in the scripture, him being a man of war. But we do know he was a real man. We know that because he was prepared to respond to life's dangers. Abraham had weapons. A real man is prepared for whatever the world will bring to his door. A real, it don't have to be a man of war, just be a man. A real man is prepared for li to live in a dangerous world. So Abraham had some weapons. He did. He had some arms, and he had some men who were trained to fight. They knew, they practiced fighting. They were able to defend themselves because they were men. They live in a dangerous world where men will attack you. They have wives and children. They understood they have to, may have to defend their wives and children. So they prepared themselves to be able to go to battle. I know he was a real man because of that. He might not have been a soldier, but he was a real man. <laughs> Amen. He had trained men and he armed them. So he had some arms. He had some things to fight with because he lived in a dangerous world. Amen. They took Lot. Maybe he didn't have any weapons. Maybe he didn't have any training. Maybe he didn't spend time lifting a little bit of weights to get some kind of strength to fight. Amen. Maybe that's why they took him. Well, his kings, they ran. Maybe they weren't strong enough. Now, there's always someone who's stronger. But a man living in a dangerous world needs to be prepared to defend himself and his family. Amen. And I pity you who live in a house with a man who isn't. If you want to marry my daughter, you need to be able to defend my daughter. Amen. And my grandchildren. Amen. You need to practice. Amen. You lift some weight. Something. Little arm like that. You better do something. 
You got to defend your family and your children and your home. Abraham was a real man and I know that because he had weapons and arms in his home to respond to the dangers of living in a dangerous world. Can't just lay down and get run over. Amen. And then he put himself and his men at risk. That's a real man. Put himself at risk. He put his men at risk to go to do battle to bring his brother back. Because we're not whole when part of us is gone. Unity, oneness, we're missing something here. And see, he didn't just run off. They took Lot. You run off, you're on your own. You do it like the prodigal son. You notice his daddy didn't go get him, right? You hear the parable about, well, we all got to go get everyone because Jesus went after the lamb. Keep reading. That's a lamb. But the prodigal son told his daddy, I want my stuff and I'm leaving. Okay, he take his stuff. He waited for him, but he didn't go after him. Lot was taken. He didn't leave on his own. And so Abraham said, we're not whole. Because he wanted to. He didn't ask to leave. They took him. They violated him. And Abraham said, I'm not whole. My brother is missing. I've got to do something. He put himself at risk. Put his men at risk. Come on, get your swords and your spear. We got to go get Abraham. Go get Lot. Get ready. We're going to go get our brother. Amen. Abraham was ready for this. He armed his 318 trained servants. And they got together and I said, we're going to go get our brother. Look at verses 15 and 16. And so he did. He had a plan. So he didn't just run up there and start fighting. You got to have a plan. <laughs> Man. And so he divided himself against them. He and his servants by night. And he smote them. Struck them. And he pursued them unto Hobah. Which is on the left hand of Damascus. And he brought back all the goods the devil had stole. Amen. That's not here. That's not. That's a different scripture. <laughs> He brought back all the goods and also brought again his brother Lot and his goods and the women also and the people. I tell you, women, I hope you got a man who'll stand up for you. He brought back the women. You can't have our women. We're coming to get them. We're coming to get our children. We're coming to get all the stuff you took. We're bringing it back. We're taking it back. They brought it back. They brought it back. Amen to God. Abram and his men, they, they, they struck the enemy. They took it, they hit him. Hit him hard. And they chased him. They put him to flight. And they brought back all they had taken, including his brother Lot. Abram was a real man. Yeah. A real man. A real man of God. He was willing to make every effort to maintain the unity of his kinsmen. Lot is missing. It's my nephew. My brother's son. We're not whole with him being missing, being taken like that. So he was willing to go to do what it took to maintain that oneness to bring back his kinsmen. So the lessons for us here are obvious. How Abram, representing the stronger brother, bore the burden of Lot, who was the weaker brother. Amen. And so the weaker brother made an unlearned and maybe perhaps a selfish choice. Guided by the lust of his eyes, he chose the best land he saw. But having high regard for his brother, esteeming peace with him to be more valuable than fertile grazing land for his cattle, and having the utmost confidence in God, Abram stepped aside and allowed his nephew to take first choice of the land. And then, afterwards, having opportunity to gloat about Lot's distress, to say, I told you so, he had a chance to do that. But Abraham chose not to do that. He chose not to be petty or vengeful, but he mounted up his army and at great risk to himself, he set out to bring his brother back, to make the family whole. Amen. There's much to take from this lesson and the, the wise among us will receive it. Some will let it go, we'll miss it. But the wise among us will receive it and will do what the word says back in Ephesians 4. Will endeavor make every effort to keep the unity of the spirit and the bond of peace no matter what it costs at great risk to yourself great cost to yourself you will strive i hope you'll be inspired by this little narrative from abraham's life to to to, to bear the infirmity of the weak to do whatever it takes to maintain the bond of unity in this church the bond of peace and in the body of christ overall amen, amen. all right come on let's pray stand together if you would